I'm drinking my cup of tea. Super villainous behavior. Hello, my name is Leonie and welcome to another episode of Leonie gets way too excited over characters that you're supposed to hate. I've made deep dives into specific tropes, I've made guides to niche genres and I felt like it was inevitable for me to make a video about my favorite problematic faves, villains. This video is going to be an analysis of what I think makes a great villain and I'll talk about my favorite villains and why I think they're so amazing. We'll discuss the question of how much backstory a villain needs to have and do you need to have one at all. And we'll also go over some of my favorite villain tropes. While I was doing research for this video, I came across tropes I'd never even heard about that I was like, oh my god, yes! So I'm excited to share them with you. In this video, you don't see the bottles that I use for the candles because honestly, look at these candles, they're so long. Like if I put them on the table like normally, you wouldn't even see the candles, so I have to put them on the ground. So now you can't see the bottle. This is my villain origin story. That you can't see the bottles and the flames in frame at the same time. <laughs> First, we need a little lesson in villainy. If you're gonna practice your evil laughter, you gotta make sure your ears are protected. I'm happy to announce that this video is sponsored by Loop Earplugs. Whether you're going to a concert or just want to create some quiet time in your life, Loop Earplugs are perfect and they have various different earplugs for different situations. My favorite are their Experience Pro ones, which reduce noise in such a way that they still allow you to hear important things like talking or traffic. I recently went on a trip to London and I would not leave the hotel with these ones because I'm pretty sensitive to noise so I was very happy that I could just pop these in whenever the city sounds were getting a little bit too much for me. The underground in London is so loud. <laughs> Their other earplug options are the quiet ones, which reduce noise even more and are great for studying, sleeping, or when you just want to create the ultimate quiet time while you're reading your book. They're completely reusable and washable, so you never have to wear those little disposable ones ever again, which is really neat. And I also think they look pretty cute. Yeah, it's like a little earpiece. So if you're still looking for a way to bring some peace and calm into your life, I highly recommend Loop Earplugs. Please click the link in the description to check out their website. And thank you again to Loop for sponsoring this video. Back to medical laughing. Now, what is a villain exactly? Well, most stories have a protagonist, usually the main character, the one that you're rooting for, the one that you're following. And then the antagonist, which is a character that antagonizes our main character and tries to stop them from getting what they want. Now a lot of stories don't really have a clear villain in the classical sense, you know? Like a lot of romance books may have an antagonizing factor like an ex that's throwing trouble into things or a lot of contemporary literary fiction doesn't have like a clear villain but there's some kind of antagonizing force sometimes it's even the main character themselves like they're just being self-destructive i actually think that's very common in contemporary literature but in this video we'll be talking about villains in a very classic sense that is very prevalent in mostly speculative fiction Let's talk about what makes a good villain. Now, this is, of course, going to be very much just my opinion. I think this is very subjective. So I've also incorporated a lot of your guys' thoughts uh, because I asked you guys in a community post to tell me about your favorite villains, what you love about villains, what you don't like about villains. And I've incorporated that in this video to also kind of give you, you know, like a little bit of a different perspective other than just my own. The first thing that, in my opinion, makes a great villain is when they kind of fit into the trope of being the arch enemy of the main character. There is a very personal, almost intimate dynamic between the main character and the villain that makes it very clear that whatever antagonizing forces are going on between them, it's very personal. And it's not just some kind of nameless random villain that's fighting against our random main character, no. It makes sense why these two specifically are each other's antagonists. Sprinkle in a little bit of psychological torture and I'm a very happy man. Now, not all villains are like this. I mean, the arch enemy is a trope 
specifically, but I have personally found that the most interesting villains that have the most compelling story to them are these kind of arch enemies. Like you guys mentioned, you like character foils. Not necessarily villains, but in terms of antagonists, someone who challenges the main character and brings out their internal turmoil. A mirror that reflects back the protagonist's flaws and shortcomings. A villain that is both taxing and stimulating. A villain with layers that we can peel back for hours. Exactly. So what do I mean exactly with this arch enemy villain? I basically mean a villain that is like the most personal primary opponent of our main character. Maybe they have similar abilities, maybe they have a similar backstory, but they might have completely opposing moral standards. There's something in the villain that just triggers the main character's worst fear. The most classic example of this is, of course, Janice to Regina George. <laughs> but yes, of course, the Batman versus the Joker, um, and I would also say Moriarty versus Sherlock. Let me give you some examples of my personal favorites. Um, one of my favorite villain dynamics will always be the Darkling and Alina from Shadow and Bone. Alina, our main character, turns out to have sun powers, uh, which is the most powerful type of magic that you can have. The only other person that has a magic this powerful is the villain, the Darkling, who has darkness powers. Well, you can kind of see where this is going. They're on the same level, they're on the same playing field, but they're literally opposites of each other. And the Dark One kind of represents what Alina could become if she decided to use her powers for evil. And that's what makes them so compelling. Like you guys said, when the villain could just as easily have been the hero if their backstory had panned out differently. When the story shows us that people aren't born evil and actually give them a good reason for what they do, making the hero and the readers questions themselves. And the great thing about the Darkling and Alina is that there's this constant back and forth of Alina finding her only equal in the Darkling, but that also causing the Darkling to constantly kind of coax her into coming to his side and, you know, using her powers for the things that he wants, which is, you know, save the world by destructing it. I've recently been doing uh, Legend of Korra mar marathons with some of my friends and when I was re-watching Legend of Korra for the first time I realized that Amon from season one has to be one of my favorite villains. I haven't watched season three yet so I think Zaheer might become one as well but basically what I love so much about Amon is that he is again the perfect villain for our main character Korra. Korra is a character whose powers all come from the fact that she has her bending abilities, her elemental bending abilities. That's what she relies on, it's what makes her powerful. And then we have a villain that can literally just take that away. He can make all of Korra's worst fears come true, and that's what makes him such an amazing villain. Another example of the mirror character would be Holland to Kel in the Darker Shades of Magic series, where they are both Antari, which are very special, rare kind of magical people. And the tragedy of the story is that Holland kind of works for the big evil bad guy, whereas Kel is our main character, but you can very clearly see how Holland could have been just like Kel if his backstory hadn't been so tragic. <laughs> Another thing, basically the reason that I was going to make this video <laughs> is because recently, and I know I'm like 10,000 years late to the party, I watched Jessica Jones for the first time. Consider me obsessed. And one of the main reasons that I loved season one so much is because of the perfect villain main character dynamic we get in Jessica and Kilgrave. And their dynamic is extremely personal. Jessica is a main character who's very edgy, she doesn't want to be controlled. And then we have Kilgrave, whose power is to literally control people with his mind. Yeah, Jessica is the only one that can stop Kilgrave because of her super strength, but more importantly because Kilgrave um, is like in love with her, has a very weird crush on her, and thinks that he can win her back by using his mind control, so he won't kill her. Whereas he would definitely kill literally anyone else. Honestly, the scariest villain. If you haven't watched Jessica Jones and you like villain main character dynamics with a lot of psychological torture, you have, you have to watch Jessica Jones. And the last example that I want to give of this 
character foil because there's so many <laughs> is Eli and Victor from one of my favorite books Vicious in which we follow two students um, that you know they're best friends they're roommates they're both trying to find ways to give themselves superpowers but then you also follow them I think about 10 years in the future where they have superpowers and they are each other's arch enemies like literally they are each other's arch enemies because they both have superpowers but they want to use it for different things and in Vicious it's extra interesting because neither Eli nor Victor are true hero like yes Victor is the protagonist and Eli is the antagonist but they're both pretty villainous you could say it's like a foil between two villains now, like I said, not every good villain has to be an arch enemy of the main character. Sometimes a really good villain is a good villain because they represent something bigger. Something bigger that is the true antagonizing force against our main character. A really great example of this would be Babel by R.F. Kuang. Babel is alternate history that takes place in the 19th century and we follow some university students that are all marginalized in some way and their struggles with the colonial system of 19th century Britain and all the racism that exists at universities and outside of that as well. Now, how do you make a villain out of something as big of a system as colonialism and racism well first of all there aren't just there isn't just one villain there are many we have kind of like the annoying rich white university boys we have a character that is a representation of a privileged white woman and kind of represent the phenomenon of the white women's tears but if i had to point out like one main villain it would be the caretaker of our main character He's not a very compelling antagonist in his own rights, but he represents the entire system of colonialism and racism that our main characters are fighting against. Another example that you guys mentioned is President Snow from The Hunger Games. President Snow is one of my favorites because in the end he's a perfect mirror for Katniss. He's not an evil mastermind who's solely responsible for all the problems, but the symbol of a system. I love the moment where she realized that just getting rid of him wouldn't solve anything. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And the last thing that, in my opinion, makes a good villain is when we are shown how terrifying and smart they are and not just told. I love villains who constantly show you how smart and terrifying they are rather than have other characters mention it. Like Azula from After the Last Airbender. From the moment she shows up on screen, every word she says and every single thing she does just further cements how much of a threat she is, not just to Aang, but also to Zuko. I love her because she wins. Now, we usually understand that a villain is going to lose at the end, right? We kind of expect that that's going to happen. So how do you still make them scary? Well, they just have to win many other times during the book. So that as a reader, you just question like, but how are the main characters going to win at the end if the villain is constantly winning all these smaller battles? So those are all the things that I think make for a good villain. But what makes a bad villain? Um, I initially really thought that I was going to have a section here about what makes a bad villain and it would be about like moustache twirling villains that are just evil for the sake of evil. But as I went through your guys' responses on the community tab on what you liked in villains, I actually realized that there's quite some discussion on the extent of backstory people want from their villains. Not everyone dislikes villains that are evil for the sake of being evil. Let me just read some of the things that you guys have said so you can kind of see the disagreement. I hate it when a villain is evil for the sake of being evil. I'm sure we all do. That's what I thought as well. I love villains who are evil for no reason. No backstory whatsoever. They're just terrible people. I hate it when villains are just bad and that's it. The best villains are those with fleshed out backgrounds and who have a motive behind their actions. I hate when books try to redeem villains and it's just, well, they have a sad backstory so actually they aren't so bad. I hate when all their motives are based only on childhood trauma. No one has a perfect childhood, we don't all go around being psycho because of it. Best villains are those that aren't bad by nature but have a story that explains why they are that way. So, sad backstory, yes or no? Do we want a villain that has a 
sad backstory to explain their action? Or does this kind of send the wrong message? Should villains just be monsters without any kind of excuse that you just really love to hate? Or is that a little bit boring and lacking in depth? I'm gonna be honest, I've always been on the side of people who love villains that have a good backstory. If there's villains that have absolutely no explanations for their behavior, it can be fun to kind of just love to hate them. I'm personally not a big fan of it because I think it's more interesting if the story has a little bit of moral ambiguity, but I can also understand that sometimes it's just fun to unapologetically hate a character. But I am very against the idea that giving your character a backstory or an explanation for their behavior means that it's okay what they're doing. I think that it's very important to understand that an explanation is not the same as an excuse. So let's explore this a little further. I think that there are two ways that a villain can have their behavior be explained. Either through backstory, things that happened in the past that make them how they are, or through goals, things that they want to achieve that make them do really bad things. And sometimes it's a pretty good goal. Let's start with a sad backstory. This is what most people mentioned when they talked about having a good reason for them being evil. They had a rough childhood. Someone killed their one true love, things like that. I think a good example of how you can do this without making it seem like you're excusing the villain's character is again Kilgrave from Jessica Jones. Without spoiling, he is given kind of a sad backstory of all the childhood trauma that he has experienced, but it's very clear from the narrative that this in no way excuses him of all the horrific killing and torture and psychological manipulation that he is doing. It just poses as, you know, getting to know the villain a little bit more and making the story a little bit more interesting. Another way of explaining the villain's behavior, and this is actually my personal favorite, is through their goal. Maybe they're actually going after a very good goal that as the reader you can kind of sympathize with. It's just the means by which they try to achieve that involves like a lot of violence and killing and wrongdoings that makes them a villain. Maybe they just want to change society. Maybe they genuinely believe that they're doing something good for the world. But the ends just don't justify the means. I personally love this because I love it when stories integrate some interesting ideas or societal critique into the story. However, I will say I do think it's sad that often it's just villains that are being used for this and rarely the main character. There's another video essay on YouTube that really goes deep into this. I hope I can try to find it for you guys. Um, but basically, I remember they mentioned that especially in like big mainstream stories like Marvel movies, the villains are the only ones allowed to fight for change. The main characters need to be the defenders of the status quo so that anyone, mass audiences can relate and root for our main characters. And only the villains are allowed to fight for something that is a little bit more politically charged or a little bit more ambiguous. The villains have the freedom to fight against climate change or stand up against colonialism, but it's only ever the villains doing this. And of course, they're always going way too far, killing a lot of people in the process, using too much violence. And I'm not a huge fan of it because it does, if used too much, kind of give off this message of like, oh, people who fight for change always go way too far. And I thought about it and I realized maybe this is why I enjoy villain characters so much, because it's usually the villain characters that are given the slightly more interesting ideas that can make you think about things. and the heroes aren't given that much freedom, I guess, to be a little provocative. So yes, I really actually love villains that are fighting for good goals, goals that you can sympathize with, but I am disappointed that this is often only given to villains, and I don't really like what that what message that gives. Okay, for the next bullet point, <laughs> for what makes a bad villain, um, I had mentally Ill, Ill villains. The only note that I took here was just no, period. 
having your villain's explanation for their behavior being their mental illness is just always a no for me. Mentally ill people already have to deal with enough misconceptions. We don't need to add to that by making our villains mentally ill. Sorry. Just had to organize some things. Actually, right after this video, I'm gonna have the next marathon of Avatar Legend of Korra Season 3, which has Zaheer, which is a very loved villain, so I'm very excited for that. And maybe I should have waited filming this video until after I've seen that season. Oh, well. Uh, oh, well. I'll put a little update here. <laughs> Next up, let's talk about some good villainous evil tropes. At first I thought about going over all of the villain tropes and ranking them, but there are so many. <laughs> there are so many. So instead I'm just gonna go over my favorite tropes and then also some tropes that I didn't know there was a name for it. And then I read the description and I was like, oh my god, yes, I love that. I didn't know that was a thing. By far my favorite villain trope that I've talked about a lot <laughs> in my videos is the, well, we're not so different, you and I. <laughs> When the hero and the villain are inextricably linked just by nature of being similar and unlike anyone else. The Darkling and Alina have this, Kel and Holland have this, and this trope often leads to another trope that I really love, and that is... Villain is the only one that is willing to teach the main character to reach their true potential. Um, this one needs a catchier name. Submissions are welcome. I also didn't find this trope on like the TV tropes list, um, so I guess I just made it up, but I, I need more people to talk about this. It's when the main character has a certain set of powers that everyone in their home is either afraid of, or it's so powerful that no one really knows how to teach them, or maybe they're made out to kind of be a freak for having these powers. Only one that understands it is the villain, and they are the only one willing to teach the main character how to use their powers or how to reach their true potential, something like that. Basically, when everyone else in the hero's life is Loki holding them back and the villain is the only one that's like, I see your potential, come to my side and I'll help you. There's a tension between the main character is gonna grow into themselves and have their, you know, character growth arc, but at the same time, is the main character maybe going to get a little bit too power hungry. Another one of my favorite tropes is the rivals turned evil, where the villain is the former rival of the main character. It's super common in anime and I need more of it in like Western TV shows and books. It's a very underused trope. Get over rivals to lovers. We're doing rivals to enemies here. If you want to pain me, if you want to make me sit in a puddle of my own tears for weeks, you have to write a book with this trope. Like the examples that I can think of are Sasuke and Naruto from Naruto, also Sora and Riku from Kingdom Hearts. And the only book example that I can think of um, is Vicious with Victor and Eli. Then of course we have our classic redemption arc, which so many of you guys mentioned. My favorite trope is the redemption arc. Granted, Zuko from After the Last Airbender is the only character I know that went through an amazing journey from hot-headed villain to the confused guy who begins to question his morality and struggles and achieves honor. I've never seen a character like him. I agree that I still don't have a better example than Zuko. Children of Blood and Bone tried to do the redemption arc, but they failed at it because they tried to do it within one book. And that's just too fast. Like you need to first build them up as a true villain and really make the reader understand that this is a villain. And then you can start their redemption arc. Like one of my pet peeves is when you can tell that the author is going to give a villain a redemption arc and they're just writing them in as a villain just so they can give them a redemption arc later. And it just kind of weakens it. And now we're going on to the tropes that I wasn't aware of yet, that I didn't know they had a name, um, but I love them. The first one I, I had kind of heard of a little bit, it's the anti-villain. I think we're all aware of it with the concept of an anti-hero, you know, a hero that's actually a little not very heroic. Basically the hero being a little bit 
darker makes them morally gray instead of just good but you can also do the same thing to a villain where you make the villain a little bit more morally gray instead of just evil and that makes them an anti-villain these are often the villains where you think hmm they kind of have a point the next trope that i love that is also extremely underused is baddie flattery <laughs> i didn't come up with these names okay it's when the villain compliments the hero of how good they are becoming and their heroism or like compliments their fighting style or something like that i just really appreciate it when there's a kind of respect between the villain and the hero coming from the villain side like the hero obviously hates the villain but the villain is like Loki, I kind of respect you. <laughs> Hades, the game, is full of this and it adds a kind of humorous tinge to the story. It can also be used to show that our main character has a little bit of a dark streak. You know that moment when the main character does something kind of bad, like they're a bit violent or maybe they even kill someone and then the villain is like, I thought I was the bad guy here. <laughs> but like less cringy than that. The next trope that I newly learned about that I apparently love is something called blue and orange morality. It's when a character or a species operate on a completely different set of moral rules than normal humans do. I mean, we're all aware of like black and white morality, right? Like the good guys are like white and good and then black is like evil and then morally gray is when it's a little in the middle. Black and white morality, it's not even morally gray. It's just operating on a completely different set of rules. And if a villain has this, it makes them very unpredictable and very erratic. And I love that. For example, Hannibal Lecter, killing, cannibalism, that's fine. But don't you dare be rude. You gotta have good manners and a good style of fashion. It makes him scary because you never know what he's gonna do. The Good Place is full of this and I think it's why it's one of my favorite TV shows and I also think that a lot of Ghibli movies, especially Howl's Moving Castle and Spirited Away, basically Ghibli movies that have a lot of spirits, you can see that the spirits have a kind of blue and orange morality and it's what makes them feel so whimsical and fantastical. I'm gonna close the curtains. I'm a villain, I don't want light. Because of course I couldn't make a video without showing <laughs> how much of a fangirl I've become of Holly Black. Holly Black uses this too for her fairies. And I think this, this explains why I like her series so much. Holly Black uses black and white morality to other her fairy creatures. She makes a really big point out of showing us that fairies are completely different from humans. And you can see that partially because like the love interest has a tail, <laughs> but also because they have this completely different set of moral rules. Killing is completely normal to them. Treating humans like ants under their boots, completely normal. And I think this is why Cardin, who is initially the antagonist in the story, so easily transitioned to being the love interest to our main character. Despite all the horrible things that he did to her in the first book. Because that's just kind of normal to Faye. The fair folk just operate under this completely different set of rules. It's also how the villains, like Maddox, Jude's father, feel morally gray, despite being like objectively horrible <laughs> and like abusive to his children. Because in the fey world and under their rules, it's all just a little bit different. Okay, we have two to go. This is a trope called, for me, it was Tuesday. It's basically where the villain is completely unaware of the effect that they have on our main character because to them, you know, it was like Tuesday. It's very normal for them to kill. And at first I didn't really understand this trope until I read that an example of this is actually happening in Six of Crows and it's happening between Kaz, one of our main characters, and Pekka Rollins. This is what it says on the TV Tropes website. Kaz's entire life has been shaped by the Kong gang boss Pekka Rollins. Flashback reveals that less than a month after spoilery really bad thing that he did to Kaz, 
Rollins didn't even recognize Kaz when he tried to confront him. After that, Kaz is motivated not only by his desire for revenge, but to make sure that when he teaches Rollins a lesson, it's one that Rollins will never forget. And he's very motivated by the fact that Rollins didn't even recognize him. And I like that. I like this trope. And then the last trope is a little silly, but I also think it should be used more often. And it's called, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to dine. <laughs> It's when the villain captures the main character for some reason, they are together somewhere, and the villain treats the main character like a guest. They're like, here, dine with me. <laughs> I don't know why I love this so much. I think it's because it adds this tension of like, oh, they're behaving in a kind of unpredictable manner, they're being nice, but when will they switch? And I just really love ridiculous dinner scenes where like two characters sit opposite of like a way too long table and have like a little conversation over a long buffet that stretches out between them over the table. I just think that's really nice. Now you may have noticed that in this video I didn't really focus on any of the specific female villain tropes because there's a whole array of villain tropes that are very specific to women. That all basically come down to evil woman is sexy or your mom. I love it when women are like, I'm in my villain era right now, and it's basically just them deciding that they're gonna speak up for themselves now. But I could honestly make a completely separate video about female villain tropes. I'm sure there's already a video on that on YouTube somewhere. That's why I didn't want to go into it in this video, because I feel like this video is already long enough. But if you have any thoughts on specifically female villains and the tropes that are often associated with female villains, leave them in the comments down below. I hope that with this video I have summoned all the villain fans, so if you have any good book recommendations or TV show or movie recommendations with a fantastic villain, please, please, I'm begging you to recommend them to me. <laughs> the sad thing about this video is because it's so dark and I decided to wear dark clothes because villains, you can't even see my outfits. You can't even see that I'm wearing a cute sweater vest. That is my villain origin story. Anyway, if you would like to see me ramble about stories and books more often, make sure you subscribe and you can follow me on my social media. I really hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I'm going right now to watch season three of Legend of Korra and I will see you soon next week with another video. Goodbye.